So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went in to her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is more to you than seven sons and has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, hey, good morning, church. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, I wanted to start by, I feel like, uh, I don't know if the pulpit's in the right place for you or not, Andrew. Does it look good? Okay, the tape's gone. So I, I don't know. I depend on the tape. Um, I want to I start by just telling you a little bit about what is, is kind of going on in this church right now. Because uh, I think there's something significant. I know there's something significant happening. Um, we, we are a church... Uh, that I believe is in, is in the middle or, or the beginning of a very significant and another uh, spiritual transition. Uh, you know, we, we, we've been through lots of transitions as a church. All the, you know, our, our whole world's been through lots of transitions in the last few years. We as a church have been, been through lots of transitions. But I feel that spiritually we're at a very significant moment right now um, as a family uh, that we need to pay attention to. And I think that, um, like, as we've broken up into these two gatherings, this is our seventh week at two gatherings, um, and the Lord's been doing great things in, you know, in, 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 uh, in us in these different ways, but there's also been a, a struggle and a wrestle, and, and there's, there's a word that we've been given, I think, um, that, that I want to share with you, um, and, and I, I want to I kind of give you a sense of what I think is happening in, 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 in the spiritual right now. Um, so just by, by way of reminder, um, this is a gathering of Jesus' people. If, you're not, uh, if you don't consider yourself a follower of Jesus, you're in the right place. We're very glad to have you here. But what we're doing here is gathering to worship Jesus. Gathering, you know, you're with Jesus as a Christian on your own. You have his spirit so you can be with him and you are with him. Uh, and hopefully you're communing with him in your day to day. Like so Monday through Saturday, you're with Jesus, focused on Jesus, abiding in Jesus, dialed in. Life with Jesus, listening to Jesus, responding to Jesus. Like that's the Christian life. If you're not living that way, I'll, you're not living the Christian life because that is the Christian life. But then we come together on Sundays and it's something special, something significant. We gather to worship Jesus and we are temples individually. And then like Paul writes in, in 1 Corinthians, we also become a temple together, corporately. So as we gather to worship Jesus, we are a spiritual people. We've been planted in this uh, city, this, this city that does not worship Jesus. The city that, that does not worship the one true God, does not follow the voice of the Holy Spirit, does not live uh, in alignment with him, but actually lives in rebellion and opposition to him. So Jesus has planted his church, his people, a spiritual organism in the city. And he said, okay, I'm going to plant you here. I'm going to fill you up and then I'm going to pour out my love and my grace through you. So it's, it, everything that's happening is spiritual. And so we fight a spiritual battle. Every day as a Christian, you wake up in a spiritual battle. I wake up in a spiritual battle. And, I, and the last several weeks, it's like the spiritual battle has been really, really intense. Like it's been really intense uh, for a lot of people. The Lord's doing really, really good things. But it's been really, really intense spiritually. 
For a lot of people, it's been very dark. And, and then what happens is we go through a transition, like from one gathering at 10 a.m. where like the whole room is full and there's, you know, like he, the 9 a.m. crowd, who I love very, very much. One of my favorite things about having one gathering was sort of the cross-pollination with a much more responsive people, which is the 11 a.m. crowd. And so the 9 a.m., it's been like, it's been really tough for me in the 9 a.m. Like, Lord, these people, like, what happened? Like, there's no response. Nobody here needs prayer anymore at the 9 a.m. Nobody needs anything. Nobody opens their mouth. I'm just, I'm, I'm exaggerating, you know. But, but it, it, there's, there's this thing, and it's not just that. It's not just the dynamics between the gatherings. There's something more happening. And then I, I've been praying through that. And then, and then this last week... I wasn't planning to share any of this, so now we're way, we're way off track here. But this last week, um, you know, just I, I, I sometimes deal with, uh, with spiritual depression, and it will hit me quite hard. And so this last week, it was just like really dark, like really heavy, like the lights went out. Like this, and, and, like I'm, and I'm not running to other things, I'm running to Jesus, I'm like, I'm pursuing him, I'm memorizing scripture, I'm working to abide and just meditating on him, keeping my eyes on him, but the lights went out. And, and, and last night and this morning, just asking, like, Lord, what is happening? Like, why can't I see? Why can't I hear you? And it was like, in conversation with Missy, it was just like he said, he said, like, I'm stripping away the things of the old season that you were depending on because there are new things now that I need you to lean into for the next season. And then I came into prayer this morning and somebody gave this word where they said, like, what, what I think that the Spirit is doing right now is like, it's like that transition of Israel from the wilderness to the promised land when in the wilderness they were fed with manna every single day. And then when they crossed the Jordan, the manna stopped. Now, they might have started to depend on the manna and gotten kind of used to just going out and collecting the manna. But now the relationship is moving to a different level. It's like what the Apostle Paul writes in the New Testament where he says, you know, that where he talks about infant Christians, baby Christians, we take milk, but the mature eat solid food. Right? The difference between milk, which somebody else or another animal has sort of digested for you and then feeds you with, and the difference between that, receiving that, and solid food is you have to do some work for the solid food. You actually have to chew now. And so as we, I feel like we're in this transition season and what he's saying is, okay, like we're, we're transitioning as a people for the sake of him pouring out his love and his grace in the city. But you have to respond now. You have to begin chewing now. Your jaw has to go to work now. You know, we, there's a response that has to come from us now. And it's different than before. Where before we come in and like just open our hands and receive, we still receive. But now we have to step out in obedience too. And I feel this really uh, strongly as, as I'm here now um, based on this text. We're closing Ruth today. Um, and I think this, I, I, I mean, unless the Lord does something different that I'm not expecting, I think I know where this is going. And it's coming to a place where the question for you is going to be like, like, how is he calling you to respond to him? How is Jesus the redeemer who has married you? Just like Boaz redeemed Ruth and married her. How is Jesus the redeemer who married you calling you to live into your marriage with him? If you will respond individually then this church and this city will change forever. If you will respond, if you will take action, if you will step out, if you will begin chewing instead of just drinking, then we will see, I think, exactly what the Lord intends for us. And I don't just, I don't think it's an if. I think it's a, I think we're already seeing it. And so um, let, let, me, let me walk into this text with you a little bit, and I, I hope things will become uh, even more clear. By the way, we're ending this week in Ruth, and then uh, next week we're beginning a week early on Advent, uh, because I, I, I really want to start talking with you about the incarnation of Jesus. We're going to spend just several weeks in the lead up to Christmas on the incarnation, which I'm really, really excited about. And 
uh, will require all of us. Oh, can I say one more thing? Just while I'm on the, while I'm ranting. Uh, I don't know why I'm asking your permission. You can't stop me. Uh, we are doing this thing. I, I didn't want to say anything the last like seven weeks and we've been at two gatherings because like I'm like, everyone's getting used to the new times and da da da. But we are doing this thing where we are becoming very consistent at loading in late. And so now we know it's 9 and 11. And like, look, I know everyone, everyone has times, days, we get late. But here's, here's another thing I know. When, when we are going to, to meet with someone very, very important, like when you get to sit down with somebody that you've like really looked up to for a long time or a CEO of a company, when you have a big meeting, you're on time. When we come to worship Jesus, the worship set on the front end is not buffer zone. That's like, that's holy. And so I just want to invite you. Like, I wouldn't say that if it was just like a couple people. But it's like everybody. It's like the, the room is less than half full at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And then it fills up in that first set of worship. I don't want to like harp on that. But I just want to say like something in me. Like, that we are a place. We are the people of God's presence. And so as a pastor, I just have this burden for us to like treat the gathering as holy. And that's where that's coming from. Okay, let me pray. And then, oh, you early people. You people that are on time. Yeah, you're shaming everybody else. Shame on you. That's terrible. That's terrible. I can't believe that. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. We love you so much. Thank you. Lord, the, everything we've already talked about in the first whatever many, however many minutes of this is way beyond us way over our heads. I thank you, Lord, that life with you is the opposite of complicated. I, Lord, I, I pray that as you give us spiritual eyes and ears today, as you speak your word to us, I, first of all, I thank you that you invite us back to just the, the first things, love for Jesus, obedience to Jesus, but then as we move in that, Lord, I thank you that you, you grow us and mature us. And so I pray for a radical and supernatural and, and visitation of God-based growth to maturity in us as a people in this, today, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this, this conclusion paragraph, the last verses of Ruth that Uta read for us, very interesting because only the first verse of our text today actually looks at Ruth. Then the entire focus of what we're seeing flips back to Naomi. If you have no idea who I'm talking about, who's Ruth, who, who's Naomi, welcome here. You need to go back and catch up because we don't have time to do that uh, today. But I want to focus with you. We're going to come back to the first verse of our text and Ruth, Mary, and Boaz and all, all of that. But, but I, want to, I want to look with you, first of all, at Naomi, where our text primarily focus, focuses. Because what this conclusion paragraph is, this is a reversal of the intro paragraph of the book. The, the, the book begins, this historical short story begins with a famine in Bethlehem. Naomi and her husband Elimelech leaving, really walking away from God and his people to go make their way in the world, specifically in the land of Moab. And while in Moab, this land where they worship and serve other gods, tragedy strikes over 10 years. Elimelech dies and then both of Naomi's sons die. Naomi is left with her two daughter-in-laws, Moabite women, only one of whom stays with her. Her, and, and then this happens. And then the, Naomi hears a report from Bethlehem that, that God has visited and is feeding his people. She's in Moab. She's in the fields of Moab, specifically the text says. And she hears a report that God is visiting and feeding his people back home. This report that God is visiting and feeding his people becomes like a net like a big net that God throws and pulls Naomi back in and he pulls Ruth, the Moabite woman, in with her. I mean, remember we looked at this. Like, like the primary evangelistic strategy, I think the only real evangelistic strategy that will ever work to reach this world is the church, healthy and alive in the presence and the power of God. It's God visiting and feeding his people. We don't have to take like a nominal church, like a lukewarm church, and try to push everybody to evangelism. What we have, that doesn't work anyways. And nobody's really compelled in the world by that. Like they come in and see our lukewarmness and it's not exciting. 
It doesn't mean anything. Like lives aren't being changed. But when the church is coming alive, in the power and the presence of God. When the church is coming alive, evangelism is automatic. You can't help it. The report goes out all the way into the fields of Moab and the prodigals like Naomi come home. And the prodigals bring with them the people in their spheres of influence because that report just spreads and spreads and spreads. And we've seen this radical act of grace. Like, like could it be that God in his, in his grace and his mercy and his wisdom actually watches people walk away from him because he will bring them home with more people in tow? I think it is. I think that is how he works. And so that's what we've been seeing. Now this conclusion paragraph is a complete reversal of the emptying of Naomi. She was emptied at the beginning of the book. She says the hand of God went out against her. Really what's been happening is she's been prepared for indescribable grace. Verse 14. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven, son has given, seven sons has given birth to him. We come to the end of this story, church. Naomi was emptied and bitter and resigned to just eking out the rest of her life because she had lost everything. We come to the end of this story. Now all anybody can see as they look at Naomi is the power and love and grace of God. The women who at one point were saying, is this Naomi? Like when she came back from Moab to Bethlehem, is this Naomi? Like they couldn't believe how broken down she was. Now they look at her, they look at Ruth, they look at Boaz and they say, what God has done for you is worth more than seven sons. In the Bible, the number seven, in, in ancient Hebrew, the number seven is a number of completion and perfection. They're saying that all the sons in the world could not compare to the grace being poured out on you, Naomi. And church, this is, this is not a one-off. This is not a one-off. Like the emptying and the filling of Naomi, this is not a one-off. This is how God consistently works. It's how he consistently works. Remember back to before summer, we were in John and we were talking about the story of Lazarus. Lazarus uh, dying and Jesus raising him from the dead. Remember what we saw before Jesus moved to raise Lazarus, he intentionally allowed Lazarus to die. When we move through these spiritual transitions, like we were talking about, when we move through these spiritual transitions, he allows what was to die so we can take hold of what is now going to be. We're going to move from a people eating manna to a people planting crops. We're going to move from a church drinking milk to a church chewing its own solid food. And Jesus allows things in our life to die because he loves us. It's the meaning of John 11 verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place that he was. Because he loved them, he delayed. Because he loved them, when he heard Lazarus was sick, he let him die. None of that sounds right to us. None of that sounds like um, intuitive to our natural mind. But if we let Jesus' spirit open up the words of scripture to us, we will see what we're missing. Look, God does not express his love for us by protecting us from pain. He does not express his love for us by protecting us from the emptying work he wants to do. He does not express his love for us by answering every desire we have for comfort and a feeling of stability and ease and safety or even protection. He knows how much we want to experience his love in those ways. He knows that. He understands that the same way you parents understand how much your kids want to experience your love in giving them whatever they want. But he loves us too much to give us what we ask for in the flesh. 
And church, you know, this is why so many of Jesus' people actually resist life with Jesus. Because the minute you get on your knees and say, okay, Lord, I abide in you. I'm going to abide in you. I'm surrendering to you. Whatever you want, I'm yours. The minute you do that, he says, okay. And he begins to dismantle what you've been at work building. The things that make you feel most safe in the natural. Most comfortable in the natural. Church, the love and goodness of God is most often expressed toward his people as he takes us all the way down into that which we fear the most, holding us the whole way. And then once we're at the very bottom, he says to us, look at me. Like my child, do you see me? Do you see that you're okay? You don't have to be afraid of the future. Like, do you see that you're okay right now? Do you remember that I've always taken care of you? This is how he expresses love to us. He takes us all the way down to the very bottom, to the empty, and says, look at me. You have nothing to be afraid of. I am going to do something through this pain that would have never been possible without it. I'm emptying you of everything that isn't me because what drives me more than anything is to have all of you and for you to have all of me. So everything else has to go. This is not rejection. This is love. This is what we're seeing as we come to the end of Ruth and we look back on Naomi's story. Everybody can see it now. All the women around Naomi, all her peers can see it now. Naomi has become a display of divine grace and love and power. And it's why we get this really interesting little note on the naming of Ruth's son, Naomi's grandchild, in verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. So this is the only place in the Bible where we see a child being named by a community instead of by the immediate family. That's significant. That's important. And what did they name this son of Ruth, this grandchild of Naomi? What did they, they named him Obed, which means servant or worshiper of God. It means that what had become entirely obvious to everybody, so much so that everybody said, this has to be his name. What had become obvious to everybody was that this story is not about Naomi. This story is not about Ruth. This story is not about Boaz. Everyone saw they were caught up in the story of God, the story that he is writing. And that the only appropriate response to, to seeing that, to understanding, that's the nature of our lives and of their lives and of our stories. And of, the only appropriate response is to serve and worship, to be consecrated to him, to be set apart to him. The God who will take us all the way down to the bottom of the emptying just to fill us up and do more through that than we could have ever possibly imagined. The road Naomi was led down was more painful, confusing, and full of blessing than she could have possibly understood. And she would have never chosen this road, but you can you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that she would never look back and want anything different. And it's the reason this book ends with a genealogy. Verse 18, now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. This, this genealogy is, is really significant. And actually, the name that would have stood out uh, the most 
to Old Testament ancient readers of this historical short story is the same one that stands out to most of Jesus' people today primarily. It's that name David. This genealogy ends at David. David was the great, great grandson of Naomi. Naomi who was empty, devastated, bitter against God. Believed that the hand of God had gone out against her. God was writing a story to bring from her line, from Ruth, from Boaz, a man called David. Now David would not just be the greatest king Israel ever knew in the Old Testament. David, church, would be the recipient of God's covenant promise that through his line there would come a king whose throne would never be vacated. That through his line there would come a king who would establish his reign for all eternity and whose government would be one of perfect peace, justice, and righteousness. Through the line of David, which is the line of Ruth, which is the line of Boaz, which is the line of Naomi. Like, do you see this? Like, the emptying of Naomi was for a purpose so far beyond what even like the historical authors of the short story of Ruth understood when they penned it. They thought David was the point. They thought the fact that David came from Naomi's line was the point. They didn't even see Jesus yet, like we do. They didn't even see that a thousand years after David, Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, the exact same town that Naomi and Elimelech left when they walked away from God because of a famine. That exact same town, the house of bread, would produce bread for the entire world. Like they did not even see how big this was when they wrote this book. When the Holy Spirit inspired the historical short story of Ruth, they still didn't see it. But we see it, church. We see how big this is. We understand this truth. Naomi was so bitter and emptied and broken. And God was going to do something that like nobody in their wildest dreams could have imagined. I mean, how good is our father? Like how skilled, how skilled is he at filling those who come to him empty? How intent and compelled is he to make sure that our lives are productive in the most meaningful ways and that we bear much fruit? He says, Jesus says, like in the gospel of John, That's what my father wants. He wants you to bear much fruit. That's what he's doing. He wants you to bear much fruit. And if you're bearing fruit, he's going to prune you so you bear more fruit. And you bear more fruit, he's going to prune you again so you bear more fruit. He's going to keep on cutting back so you can keep on producing fruit. Which, as I said at the beginning, like that is where we are as a church. He's pruning so we can bear more fruit. And prune. But now something, something different has to happen. We have to respond in a different way in this season than we were in the last season. And, and, I, and I think we're going to see a little bit of what that looks like. You know, it, it, it's, it's super cliche to say this, but I'm going to say it anyways. Um, it's, it's very cliche to say that God has a plan for your life. But I, I believe the Holy Spirit wants you to hear this. God has a plan for your life. Like, he has prepared works already for you to walk in. He he knows exactly what he's going to do with you. We were away at, like, um, overseas somewhere, and someone had this word in this gathering we were at and and it just it like it was like they said it but it might as well like the spirit spoke so powerfully to me I I saw it too it was really something and like this this person got out this woman and just said like I see I see like circles drawn around everybody here 
circle, and it's like, it's like God has set your limits. And I, I right away thought of the psalm, like the lines have fallen for me. In pleasant places, indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Like he's drawn the lines around you already. All that remains for you to fulfill all the purposes he's given you. You don't have to be afraid of missing it. You don't have to be afraid of trying to make it to be more than, it, than he's already ordained for you. All you have to do is within the limits he's drawn for you, abide in him. Love him. Be like Obed, a servant and a worshiper of God, and he will produce fruit through you. So, so we said, you know, Naomi comes back because she hears this report that God is visiting and feeding his people. The visitation and feeding of the people of God becomes the reason Naomi comes back. The prodigal comes back bringing the outsider because of what's happening in the people of God. And now notice, Naomi's all filled up. I mean, she's all filled up, more than seven sons. She's, she's being given everything, and it's more than any of them could ever comprehend it. Like Jesus will come, like God incarnate will come from this line. It's ridiculous. This, this is just like mind-numbingly like beautiful. But, but I want you to notice, I want you to notice how this comes to Naomi how all these blessings come to her. It was the report of God's people that brought her back. But now look at what God uses to fill her up. All along in this book, we've talked about the fact that Boaz is a foreshadowing of Jesus, a type of Christ. From the moment Ruth set her heart to lean on grace, she walked into the field of Boaz and was protected and provided for and filled up. She has been loved in ways that she had no right to under the law and she has been carried along by the will of someone else to do her good. Every bit of Boaz's intentions with Ruth have pointed to Jesus and that does not change as we come to chapter 4. And it's why what happens in Ruth 4.13 matters so much. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Church Boaz marries Ruth. Boaz marries Ruth. Boaz marries the one he redeemed. And, I, and I, I just, I'm afraid that we might miss this because we know the end of the story kind of from the beginning. It's not just that Boaz protects Ruth and provides for Ruth and fills her up with grain. And it's not even just that he redeems Ruth, he marries Ruth. This marriage is the redemption. And church, this is exactly what the ultimate redeemer, Jesus, does with those who come to him. The marriage is the redemption. He doesn't just want you in his field where he can protect you and provide for you and fill you up with grain. He marries those who come to him. He makes himself one with those who come to him. It was scandalous how Uda really emphasized the next words. And Boaz went into her. And God caused her to conceive and she bore a son. But this is what happens with those who come to Jesus. Just like Jesus says, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. He also prays that we will be in him in the very same way, and him in us. He comes into us, we come into him, and there's fruit produced. Paul tells us in Ephesians 5 that the reason we have marriage is because it is a picture of this mystery. The reason why we care about marriage is because it's a picture of this mystery. 
Jesus' relationship with the church. That's what marriage is. God has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for you. He has fruit that he wants you to bear. And there's also a reason he wants to bless and fill you. He wants to bless and fill you. This has always been his plan for his people. He wants to bless and fill his people. Just like he blessed and filled Ruth to bless Naomi, he blesses and fills his people so we can become a blessing. When God first gave the covenant to Abraham, he said this would make you a blessing to all the nations. One of the reasons why God brought the Gentile church in, us, is because Israel forgot that they were in the world to bless the nations. And the ch- as a church, we can't forget this now either. We can't make the exact same mistake. He wants us to come to him today as a church right now together and find exactly what Ruth did, redemption in marriage. What what this morning is about, if you're already a Christian, is a renewal of your vows. What this morning is about, if you're not yet a Christian, is getting engaged and married. Instead of being married to the husband of the law who keeps you condemned and under the wrath of God, moving and being married to Jesus, the Son of God, who will set you free from the curse of the law because he became the curse for you. This is redemption in marriage. That's what the Christian life is. Now, here's here's what this means practically. Is that like the end of my sermon? Is that what that means? supposed to be. Don't worry. I'm going to be on time today. I got a clock right here. They've been bugging me at least lately. Apparently I preach too long. Here's what this means practically. Jesus is a perfect husband. He's perfect. He's perfect. So if there's a problem in the marriage, guess whose fault it is? Right? He's perfect. His end of the deal, perfect. He's there anytime you need him. He's always there for you. And he knows how to love you perfectly. He knows how to love me perfectly. He knows how to love the church perfectly. If there's a problem, if we feel detached or numb or disconnected or jaded or angry or bitter, guess who the fault is with? It's with us. This is like, This is just very, very easy to understand for us. Look, Jesus, what does it mean to be married to Jesus? To be married to Jesus, to come into that covenant with him, means that he not only loves you, but is committed to you exclusively. He is committed to his bride, the church, exclusively. That's what marriage is, right? That's that covenant that we make. We make a covenant that says, forsaking all others. Forsaking all others now, it's just you. And this is what Jesus has said to his church. Forsaking everything else, it's just you. I've given everything for you. I've emptied myself for you. I love you. I'm exclusive to you. I'm entirely committed to you. But in a marriage church, there has to be two people saying the same thing. Otherwise, it's not marriage. It's just a stalker. Right? If you're committed and in love with somebody who's not committed in love with you, that's a problem. Often, like, Jesus, the perfect husband, perfectly committed, perfectly faithful in the covenant, perfectly, like, like in love with his bride, is just waiting for his bride to love him. Now, you know what Jesus the groom wants from his bride? He just wants the same thing from us that he's given to us. He just wants us to love him exclusively. He wants you to love him exclusively. 
He wants me to love him exclusively. And if I love him exclusively in my life and you love him exclusively in your life, this church will love him exclusively too. And we will become a people of God's presence. I feel Jesus' spirit on this today. If you feel stuck in life with him, you need to remember. I don't know, you might feel hurt. You might feel bitter like Naomi. You might feel emptied out. You just might feel like, the, like I felt this last week, like the lights just went out. If you feel stuck in your relationship with Jesus, I, I want to remind you this is a marriage. And he is calling you, us as his bride, and you, Christian, as a part of his bride, he's calling us back to the very reason we are alive today. To love him exclusively. To worship him exclusively. To live for him exclusively. That means forsaking all others. Team, why don't you come on out? We're going to go into communion, and I want to ask you this question. So we're going to, the band's going to lead us in a song. There'll be servers up here at the front. You come up, receive, they take the cup from them, and go back. You can, you can use the whole room. You can go anywhere you want, but... But uh, you can go back to your seat, whatever is best for you. And, but in this song, as you, as you come forward and take this uh, little cup, like this, this is not, just please, just not go through the motions with this. This is for you. This is for you and your husband. This is, again, the renewal of your vows. And Jesus doesn't leave us guessing at, at like what it means to live in a, in a healthy relationship with him, what it means to be alive in him, what it means to love him exclusively. He doesn't leave us, us guessing. He wants us, he wants to tell us. And so the question that, that I just think like we need to answer today and, and we need to actually step out and respond with to move from the manna to the planting of crops, to move from the milk to the solid food, to move in obedience in this, in this spiritual transition he has us in as a church. Like the question is, Jesus, what, what do I need to do to invest in our marriage today? Like, think about it that way. Think about it that practically. Doesn't matter if you're single, divorced. Doesn't matter. Like, what do I need to do, Jesus, to invest in my marriage with you today? Run it through that grid. Jesus is a real person. His spirit is a real person. He is married to you. The marriage is the redemption. The marriage is the Zoe life. The marriage is the new life. What do I need to do to be married? You just might need to spend some time with your husband today. You just might need to tell your husband you love him today. Can I, can I give you a hint too? Like another one? If you're committing adultery, you know how to heal your marriage all the way up? It's to stop committing adultery today. It's to stop worshiping other gods today. It's to stop giving yourself to other idols today. To stop saying, I know you want to provide for me. I know you tell me I'm safe and secure in you, but I'm going to try to make myself secure over here. That's, that's, that's idolatry. That's adultery. That's worshiping other things, putting your trust, your hope in other things. Come back to your husband. He is way stronger than Boaz. Come back to your husband today. That's what communion is. We're remembering the price that our husband paid to redeem us, to marry us, to buy us for himself like they used to buy brides in the olden days. It's the price that he paid and there is, can only be one response and that response is whatever he's putting on your heart right now. 
a way for you to love your husband. So Holy Spirit, would you speak to us as your people right now? Would you speak to us individually? Would you show us exactly what it means to love you today? What it means to come back to you as our redeeming husband today. You are perfect. We confess, Lord, none of us are perfect. We're all very, very far from perfect. But Lord, thank you that your strength is perfected in our weakness. And so we come to you weak and we say, Jesus, we want to love you. I pray you would put strength and courage and conviction and excitement and passion in our hearts to have a vibrant, healthy relationship and marriage with you, Jesus. Even as we come forward and take these little cups, Lord, would you, would you speak to us in this moment?